Hello, Radiant Church. How's everybody doing? Good. Welcome to Big Give Weekend. So glad that you're joining and those of you who are with us online, wherever you are, uh, we just uh, want to welcome you and wish you a happy Thanksgiving weekend as well as this Big Give Weekend. We do this every year. And uh, this year, obviously, like everything else, you have to improvise and adapt. Uh, but what we've decided to do is actually lean into all of the things that have basically limited our ability to do things like normal, and we've actually taken it up a step. And uh, our outreach that we are a part of for Big Give globally uh, is something that is, uh, it's a first for us. We've never done it this, this big, this global, this large of an impact, but we're really, really excited about it. And at the end of the service, we're going to receive that Big Give offering. Uh, but one of the things that uh, Pastor Joel Dorlag, our missions pastor, brought up to me about our Big Give booklet was, don't throw this away after Big Give weekend, because this is a really, really good tool for prayer. Because of all of our missionaries and all of our global partners, it doesn't just share with you the need in the moment, but it shares actually prayer points and what they are doing and who they are globally. This is a powerful tool. So keep it with you. Keep it with your Bible and your journal. And when we pray, uh, pull that out and pray for our missionaries. It's one of the things that I do on a weekly basis. I pray for our missionaries. We have prayer, a whole prayer team that is our missions prayer team that pray on a consistent basis, not only for, but sometimes through Skype and uh, Zoom and all kinds of other things. They pray with our missionaries. And uh, so we would love for you to join in, whoever you are, where you are, praying for our missionaries globally, uh, and then also participating in the Big Give this weekend. And uh, we've had a couple of people say, and actually ask, hey, I'm not ready this weekend. We're going to keep the Big Give open, that offering, for a couple weeks uh, so that those who weren't prepared this weekend, maybe this week or next weekend, uh, depending on how your pay schedule is or when things get freed up, uh, you'll still have an opportunity to give big because we want to make a big impact, right? We want to reach the world with the love of God. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen. All right, thank you very much. Uh, take your Bibles out if you would today. Open them with me to Matthew chapter 13. This is part two of a message I started last weekend called The Divine Reset. Now, I will tell you, I had planned on starting a brand new holiday or a Christmas series this weekend, and uh, I'm going to do that in a couple weeks because next weekend, uh, Pastor Tim Matthews is going to be bringing the message. It's going to be powerful. He already told me today uh, what he's bringing. It's kind of a standalone message, and uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to rock your world. It's going to be incredible. Uh, and then I'm going to come back the weekend after that, and I'm going to start a new series called Mary's Miracle. And we're going to be taking a look at the Christmas story through the eyes of Mary. It's going to be really powerful, I think. Uh, but what, why I changed is because last weekend, two things. Number one, typically when I write notes for messages, I always write way more than I can ever get to. Because uh, I have this sense of guilt if I don't have enough content. Uh, my pastor who trained me is like, Leighton, if you don't have anything worth saying, don't get up in the pulpit. So I always make sure I've got like tons of notes. And I can, uh, you can give me one bullet point and I could probably go for a couple hours. So I have all these notes and you probably have noticed I don't often get to all of the points. But the other thing, the other reason I, I wanted to come back to this is because I believe the second part of this message that I maybe touched on last weekend is so important for the hour that we are living in. It's based on the parable that Jesus taught about the sower and the soil that the seed was sown into. So look with me here at Matthew chapter 13, beginning in verse number one, uh, it says, that same day Jesus went out of the house and he sat beside the sea and great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a boat, he sat down, and the whole crowd stood on the beach, and he told them many things in parables, saying, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seed fell on rocky ground, 
where they did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up. And since they had no depth of soil, but when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up, choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil, and it produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. And then he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. I think we oftentimes underestimate the power of Jesus' parables. They in and of themselves are containers of kingdom of God principles, but they're only applicable and they're only powerful to the ones who have ears to hear them. Jesus taught the multitudes in parables, number one, because people learn by stories really well, but number two, because you have to try, you have to focus to draw the meaning out of them. It's not obvious. You have to think through it because there's a lot of truth that is wrapped up in it. This is a parable that is more applicable in our day than almost any of the parables that Jesus taught. And I know that that's a big statement. They're all applicable. It's all the word of God. It's all good for us. But I'll tell you, when I take a look at the condition of our culture and the way that we are all bombarded 24 hours a day with content, information, people putting a demand on us for our focus and putting a demand on our time and our resources. And we all only have 24 hours in a day. What I'm seeing is that there is, a, there is an ADHD type of cloud that is kind of hovering over our culture where we can't really focus on anything because we've got 3,000 things coming at us all at the same time. But yet then we also have uh, a post-traumatic stress syndrome that is happening to our soul because in the middle of all these voices, we've got anxiety at a level that we've never had before and we're trying to figure out where we fit in, who we're supposed to be loyal to, what, we're, what we can do, what decisions we can make that are gonna get us to where we feel like we're safe, we're secure, where we belong, that we're successful. And people are stressed out and we have more information, we have more resources than we've ever had in an entire generation, and yet none of it has solved any of our problems. We have more money, but yet we're still bankrupt. We have more information, but we're still ignorant. We have more education, but we're still stressed out. We still have all of the social ills that we've always had. Why? It's because the issue is how we are dealing with our heart. And remember what the writer of Proverbs, Proverbs says this. It says, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues of life. Guard your heart with all diligence, because out of it flows all the issues of life. The, the center of our existence doesn't start out there. It starts with what we do in here. In the whole series on being a disciple, this is what we focused on. And it's what Jesus is talking about in this parable. The soil that he is referring to has to do with our hearts. And if we're going to be people that seize the moment that we are living in, where I believe God is calling the church to reset to reset our affections, to reset our commitments, to reset our beliefs. You know, everybody loves a reset. It's like you're playing a game, all of a sudden you mess it all up, and you, uh, let's start over. Boom, nothing like a reset. Oh, you know, here, here we go. Let's, we're, we're three quarters of the way through a movie. It's like we took two days off, we come back to it. Oh, what are we gonna do? Start it over. We all love fresh starts. Jesus in the kingdom calls us to reset our heart. In other words, recalibrate our hearts back to the things that are the priorities of our life, the priorities of the kingdom of God. And that's why the writer of Hosea, the prophet, when he says in Hosea chapter 10, he said, sow for yourself righteousness, reap steadfast love, break up the fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord. This is what he's talking about. It's time for a divine reset. 
It says, so that he may come and rain righteousness upon you, for you have plowed iniquity and you have reaped injustice. We can see that in our own nation. We've spent time plowing iniquity and what are we reaping? Injustices. It says, and you have eaten from the fruit of lies. This is huge. Because you have trusted in your own way. What do we need to reset from? Listen to me. We need a reset from doing things our way. We need a reset, a stop, a pause, and say, wait, 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 wait. We've been doing it our way. We've been doing it the way of the world. We've been eating from the tree of lies. And look at where it's gotten us. What do you do when you've dug a hole that you can't get out of? My grandpa used to say, if you're in a hole and you've dug yourself a hole and you're in the hole, the best way to get out of it is stop digging. Stop digging. That's the first step. Look at where our own efforts, look at where our own intelligence, look at where doing things the way of the world, what everybody else has done, look at where it has gotten us. What does God tell us to do? Time out. Stop and do what? Seek the Lord. It's time to seek the Lord. It's time for you to allow the Lord to put the plow of the Holy Spirit in and break up the soil of our heart. What does a divine reset look like? Well, I believe it starts with, number one, we have to reset our priorities. And this is what Jesus begins with in this parable, the seed and the sower. The, the sower is a farmer, and he has seed, and he's going out, and he's going to sow it, he's going to plant it. And he's doing it because his intention is to reap a harvest. But he recognizes that sowing the seed today is not going to produce a harvest today. What I sow today is going to go into my future as a harvest. I won't really see the effects of the decisions I make today until months and years from now. The sower goes out and he's sowing seed. And he has good seed. It's probably wheat that this particular farmer has because that was common in Israel. Or think about our own culture around here. We have a lot of cornfields. Think about corn seed. I was reading something on seeds and it was, it was very interesting because it was talking about the, ancient, uh, the, the history of ancient agriculture. And it said that when they went into King Tut's tomb, when they excavated it in the early 20th century, or the late 19th century, and they excavated this pyramid, this vault where they had buried this Egyptian pharaoh, 3,000 plus years ago, they found all kinds of gold, they found all kinds of sculptures and architecture, they found skeletons of servants that were supposed to escort him across the, the river into the afterlife. Obviously, they didn't make it. And you know what else they found? They found bags of corn. Bags of corn that had sat undetected for thousands of years. In fact, they said that genetically, it, they thought that that type of corn was extinct. But they took the corn out of a 3,500-year-old pyramid, and they took it into the laboratory, and they planted it in soil, and they watered it, and guess what it did? It grew. First time in over 3,000 years that seed, that kind of seed, had actually grown. It had become extinct on the face of the earth, but what nobody knew is it was hidden. And when that seed was extracted, when it was taken, and it was put in the soil, it does what seed is designed to do. A seed is a container of genetic code. But it will only release the genetic code on the inside of the seed when it finds the right conditions in the right soil. There, listen to this. There is no expiration date on a seed. There is no expiration date on a seed. And let me tell you something about the Word of God. There is no expiration date on the Word of God. 
Somebody can say, well, it's only 2,000 years old. It doesn't work anymore. It only, it only does not work if it doesn't penetrate our hearts. It always works. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of God remains forever. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says, the word of God is powerful and living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. It has no expiration date on it. The fruit out of our lives in relationship to the kingdom of God is not determined on whether the word, the Bible or God's word is true or not. It has to do with whether our heart is healthy or not to receive it. When God's word finds a healthy heart, guess what it produces? The genetic code of heaven. It will produce the fruit of the kingdom of God to the degree that the soil is prepared. What does it mean for you and I to have a reset? Well, Pastor Lee, I've been trying to live for God for all of these years, or I, I grew up in church, and now I'm kind of coming back, and I'm trying to figure out how do I, how do I get my life changed? Number one, listen to me. You're not going to fix, you're not going to change your life in a day. You can make a decision today that a decade from now is going to have massive fruit, that a year from now is going to have massive fruit, but you're going to have to do more than try and microwave yourself into fruitfulness. We live in a microwave, minute rice society. It's like I want to take popcorn in a bag with preset oil, put it in a microwave, beep, 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 and 30 seconds have Orville Redenbacher in a bowl. We want minute rice. We want everything quick. We want, you know, five-minute oatmeal. We want everything quick. You can microwave oatmeal, but you can't microwave maturity. You're going to have to Reset your heart. And listen, if you're looking at your life and going, well, I'm not getting the same kind of fruit out of my life that they are. Maybe, it just, you know, maybe, maybe God's word just doesn't work anymore. Listen, the word, it's, it's kingdom genetics. We were not saved by a perishable seed, but by an imperishable seed. But it has everything to do with the soil. And the first thing that we're called to do, Jesus teaches it in his parables, we got to reset our priorities. Because the first type of soil, it says the sower goes out and he sows, and some fell along the wayside. And the wayside is the path that has been packed down and the soil has become hard. Let me tell you where the wayside is. The wayside is American culture. Because when the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached in places where the people have never heard it, miracles break out, salvations occur, lives are changed, society is altered. The same gospel, but we preach it in America, and you know, it's like, oh, I've heard that before. Oh yeah, I watched that movie. I saw that book in a drawer at the Hampton Inn. Yeah, 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 I grew up on the Bible. Yeah, Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. You know what we've done? We've become familiar. We've packed down the word of God. Our heart has become packed down and hardened to who Jesus is, what he has done, and even to the word of God itself. And we've actually become indifferent and we become familiar with it. You know, there was one place. How many know Jesus did a lot of miracles? I don't know what your favorite miracle is, but my favorite miracle out of all, as if you can have a favorite miracle. You know, the favorite miracle is the one that you need that God delivers. But my favorite Bible miracle is the blind man that Jesus healed, blind Bartimaeus. I mean, because healing blind eyes, just amazing story me. And there's personal reasons why that's my favorite. But here's what's interesting. Jesus performed thousands of miracles. In fact, John said at the end of his gospel that if all that Jesus did was recorded in books, there would not be enough books in the world to contain them. There was one place that Jesus, the Son of God, could not do Many mighty miracles. It's, he still did a couple, because he's still Jesus. I mean, he goes into one of the hardest places, 
And he can't, the Bible says he could not do many mighty miracles because of their unbelief. But he still did a few. On our best days, we get a few. On his worst days, he got a few. But listen, the place he could not do many mighty miracles was in a town called Nazareth. It's the place he grew up at. Because they were familiar with him. It says, isn't this Jesus? I mean, Joseph's son, and we've got his brothers and sisters running around. We wa- I taught him in Sunday school. I changed his diaper in nursery. And now you're coming along, Jesus, trying to tell us that you're the Messiah, that you're the, Luke 4, Jesus stands up in the synagogue, reads Isaiah chapter 61, says, Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal up the brokenhearted, recovery of sight to the blind. And, and then he rolls up scroll and says, this is, this is fulfilled right now. They should have been like, yes! What would happen if Jesus rolled up into Radiant Church, took the podium, read something out of it, and said, I know you've been waiting for this. I'm here, and it's fulfilled right now. How would we respond to that? I'll tell you what, the big give offering would rise. (laughs) But do you know what they did when he did that? It's like, who, who does he think he is? Do you know why? They were familiar with him. Wayside. Their hearts were so hardened towards who he was and familiar with Jesus that the seed could not penetrate the surface of their heart. And the enemy came, the birds of the air came and devoured the seed. I wonder how many times we read the Bible, hear a sermon, have somebody share a testimony, read a devotional, but because we've become so familiar with Jesus, he's just become part of our world, part of our culture, that we're not standing in awe of him anymore, that we don't have an awe and respect for the word of God like we need to, like we used to. And instead of that seed that could produce change in us, it sits on the surface of our life and it awaits for the enemy to come and devour it. Apathy, indifference. It'll steal from us, church, God's kind intentions and his promises. This is the first part of the parable. If we're going to reset, if we're going to have a divine reset, we have to reset our priorities. In other words, his presence, his word, this has to become life to us. This has to become the priority to us. He has to become the priority to us. Number two, Jesus teaches in this parable, and he's talking about the second kind of soil, which he says in verse number five, other seed fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up since they had no depth of soil, but when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Second soil that he's talking about is rocky soil, hard, rocky soil that it's it's rock with a little bit of dirt on top of it, that the seed got below the surface and it began to activate the seed to release what's on the inside of the seed. It begins to grow up, but because it was on rock, rocky soil, it could not put deep roots down. And without deep roots, when the Noon sun of the Middle East comes out where it's 115, 120 degrees out. There was no way for that plant to access water systems that were underneath the rock that it needed to sustain life. It had no roots, and so it withered away. And Jesus gives us the interpretation of it. He says that this particular soil has to do with those who... When the heat of persecution, says in verse number 20, as for the one who was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word, we hear it, immediately we receive it with joy, yet we have no root in ourselves. We endure for a little while. And listen to this. This is the next part. When tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. 
So I'll paint the picture for you. Jesus is saying that there's a kind of heart condition that we can have, that we're hungry for God. And we receive the word. The seed finds a place in the soil of our hearts. But there's rock, there's, there's hardness there, there's limitation, there's a boundary marker there that keeps that word from going too deep into us so that in the hard times, in the difficult times, persecution and tribulation, the word tribulation means trouble, hard times. Let me, let me give you the, the modern translation of the Greek word tribulation, 2020. Might as well write that in your margin. It's right there in the Greek. 2020. When persecution arises or tribulation arises because of the word. Notice it says that not, not around the word, but because of the word. It says because they have no root in them, they shrivel up under the heat and they die. They fall away. So what do we got to do? How do we experience a divine reset? Well, number one, saints of God, we have to deepen our root systems. Have to deepen our root systems. How do you deepen your root systems when you have rock underneath a shallow soil? You have to break up the rock. You got to break it up. Jeremiah said, your word is like a hammer that breaks into pieces the rock. We have to put our roots deep. We break up the rock, that hardness. I think so many of us, especially in the body of Christ, just in, in our culture, we, we love God, we love Jesus as Savior, forgiver of our sins, but the hardest part of following Jesus is when you come into conflict with a culture that disagrees with the kingdom of God. When culture says, no, 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 we don't believe that. And if you believe that, we're gonna cancel you. And if you believe that, you're a bigot. And if you believe that, you're old fashioned. If you believe that, you're unintelligent. You have no place in our society. We're not gonna make room for you at the table. We're gonna mark you. We're gonna unfollow you. We're gonna cancel you. We're gonna tag you. And immediately, Christians are, who love God are like, oh, well, 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 maybe I don't believe that. Oh, you know what? You, that's old-fashioned. You're just reading the Bible through an old-fashioned lens, but it's 21st century. We've evolved. We don't believe like that anymore. We're a sophisticated culture. And listen, there's people in the church that believe like us, so you should just evolve your view. And if we don't have an understanding, if we don't have deep roots in the Word of God, here's what happens. We're just like, well, maybe I'm wrong. Well, maybe they're right. Maybe all the word of God isn't for us today. Maybe only half of it is for today. Maybe Jesus didn't understand what we would be facing in the 21st century. And had he understood it, he would have written the Bible differently. Because after all, God's not quite as smart as 21st century America. And if he would just ask us, we could help him out. We could help God rewrite the Bible. Do you know that in China right now, they're rewriting the Bible because the Bible is in conflict with the Communist Party. So now they're just going back and rewriting the Bible so that it lines up with the Communist Manifesto. And we just look at that and that's not fair. We're doing it in America. Well, I'm not sure I believe that part. And I'm not sure that that really applies anymore. Well, that's not for me. I like this, but not that part. We want salad bar Jesus. We want to go to the Ruby Tuesday translation of the Bible. Remember when you could go to a restaurant and actually eat at a salad bar? So we take a plate with our lettuce and we're just like, well, here's my Jesus. It's lettuce. And I like the Jesus that forgives my sins. That's the, you know, that's the chickpeas. And I like the Jesus that speak words of life over me. That's the carrot shred. And, and I like a little bit of the bacon bits on there. But you know what I can't stand is, mm, I don't like lima beans. And I don't like beets. Nobody likes beets. Somebody likes beets. Not me. All you beet lovers, there will be an altar call for you all to get right with God. 
It's like sunflower seeds. I like, I like that part of Jesus. I like the nothing can separate you from the love of God part of Jesus. But what about this? Take up your cross and follow me and deny yourself. Oh, I don't like that. I'm skipping that part. Or if you don't forgive, you can't be forgiven. Oh, I don't, I don't like that part, so I'm not putting that on my Jesus. And we go through the whole salad bar of the Bible. We pick the parts out that we like. We say no to the parts that we don't. And we've got our customized Jesus. And that's not what Jesus called us to. That's rocky ground. And we got to go with the jackhammer of God's word and we got to put that to the things that hinder love and let God by the Holy Spirit and his word begin to break that stuff so we can actually get some deep roots. Ephesians chapter three calls us to be rooted and grounded in the faith and in love. The love of God. Part of getting deep roots is encountering the love of God. Colossians 2, verse 6 talks about being rooted and built up in our faith. In other words, we got to go deep, saints. This is not time for us to have a Mickey Mouse, simple, shallow understanding of the Word of God. This is a time to go deep, dig deep into the Word of God. So that when the heat of persecution comes, you have been fully convinced by a study of the word and an encounter of the word. When we encounter Jesus as we study the word of God, two things happen. It, it, the word gets put into you and then it gets solidified by love. It gets fed by love and encounter and personal intimacy with the Father. And then it begins to develop root systems all through you. I can't tell you, I, oh, I love to study the Bible because that's where I encounter Jesus the most. When I, when I get alone with him and I'm reading through it, which I've done for years and years and years, I'm not doing it from a scientific method like, oh, uh, you know, just reading the word. Oh, that's, that's an acronym. I'll just boom, boom, boom. I get alone and Jesus meets me there. He is the living word who helps interpret the written word. And let me tell you more times then not, Jesus meets me with the Holy Spirit jackhammer. He's like, you got, you got rock in this area of your life. I'm just like, well, I'm doing really good in other places. And he's like, nope. It's like, ah, but now you can get deeper roots there. And it's not hurtful because it's not rooted in shame and condemnation. Jesus meets me there in love and I get rooted and grounded in love with Jesus. I just have a hard time reading the Bible. Read it, live it, breathe it. I can't read that good. Get it on Audible. Well, the ESV is too hard. Get the New Living Translation. The print's too small. Get a magnifying glass. Sell your dog, hire a neighbor kid to read the Bible to you. Print it out at Kinko's, plaster it on your fridge, put it to a song, memorize it, talk about it, live it, breathe it. Well, that's pretty extreme. You don't think we're living in crazy days? We can quote every line from our favorite movie. We know all the stats of our favorite basketball players. We got all the lyrics memorized to I Love the 80s songs on Sirius XM radio. We know all the drum solos, guitar, lit, come on, some, we know them. We know all the, but yet we're just like, well, the Bible's really hard. It's really tough. Trying to read it, but it's just so hard. Don't start in Leviticus. Get somebody that you read the Bible. Did you read that? Where Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me. That is messing with me. Call somebody, get a text thread, get a YouTube Bible reading plan. Talk to three or four friends that you read it together and create a thread and grow together. But get deep. Because persecution and tribulation are gonna come for the word. You gotta have a deep on the inside. All right, I'm done messing. Number three. Matthew 13, 7. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. 
We've got to plow up competing loyalties because that's what thorns are. Jesus said the thorny ground is the seed that was sown on, on the ground that had thorns and the thorns are the deceitfulness of riches and the cares of this world. So it grows up, the seed gets planted, it begins to grow up. In other words, there's fruitfulness of the kingdom. We give our lives to Jesus, we're going to church, we're serving, we're practicing generosity, we're praying, but yet there's unsubmitted motives and intentions of our heart that are being drawn towards the things of this world and being deceived by the allure of wealth. Listen, nothing will sink you faster than pursuing wealth and fame and notoriety. Nothing. Rockefeller, who was one of the wealthiest men who've ever lived, owner of Standard Oil when it was a monopoly, was asked one time, how much money will be enough? He said this, just a little more. This is a man who would be wealthier than Steve Bezos, or is it Steve, or Jeff Bezos. He was wealthier than Amazon and Bill Gates combined. Wealthier than both of them combined. And he said it still wasn't enough. Materialism, consumerism, cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, it competes with us. And what it does is it begins to choke out what the word of God is doing in us. And it will limit our fruitfulness in the kingdom of God. It's time for a divine reset to say, God, I'm not pursuing those things, I'm pursuing you. I'm pursuing your purpose for my life. You know the greatest place on the planet, most beautiful place on the planet, most restful place on the planet, has the best views, and everything that your heart could ever want, I know where it's at. It's right in the middle of God's will for your life. That's where it is. You can be on an island in the Caribbean and have no peace in your heart and no purpose. And you can have no money in the bank and nobody knows your name, but you're serving Jesus where he's called you, and you will have more joy and more peace and more rest. You'll be the wealthiest person on the face of the earth. The enemy comes and he sows thorns, thorns that wanna choke out your fruitfulness, wanna steal from you your inheritance, wanna keep you from being fruitful, but when we allow the Holy Spirit to come and to plow up, reset our hearts. It leads to number four, which is we become good soil, prepared soil, ready soil, that when the seed touches our lives, it produces 30, 60, and 100-fold return. What's this? It's talking about Church, we need to reset our expectations because you were created for multiplication. You were born again, brought into the kingdom of God, not just to live a safe, risk-free life and arrive safely at death someday. You were brought into the kingdom of God with calling, with gifting, with anointing, with resources, with time, with giftings and experiences that God has invested on the inside of you. And then his word illuminates the path that you should walk in. And along the way, from the moment Jesus saves you to the moment you see him on that day, you were created to produce 30, 60, and 100-fold return. You were created to make disciples who make disciples disciples who make disciples. You were created to impact the world, to send the gospel, to be a witness, and to demonstrate the love of Jesus. We've got to raise our expectations, church, because so many of us have a survival mentality. I just want to survive. I just want to make it to heaven. 
Listen, his ability to keep you is so much stronger than your ability to run from him. But this is, I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about what you do while you're here. Because someday, listen to me, someday all of us who love Jesus and are saved will look back from the perspective of eternity and we will see our lives. And I don't know how this is gonna work. Maybe heaven has big LED walls. And I think it could something like this. I think on one screen, Jesus will show us our life as it was and say, now this is the reward because of what you've done. I'm not talking salvation. I'm talking reward. He's gonna say, this is what you did. Here's your reward. Here's what you could have done on the other screen. Here's the impact you could have made if you would have trusted me more. Here's the difference you could have made if you had prioritized the kingdom more. Here's what you were created for. Here's what you did. I don't believe there's gonna be regret in heaven, but I do believe that there's gonna be reward and sobriety in heaven. God wants us to arise and shine and to realize we were created for more. I wanna invite you, if you would, to stand with me. Wherever you're at, in the presence of the Lord, just stand to your feet with me. And I wanna pray over us in this moment. And what I would ask of you is, what is the Holy Spirit saying to you today? I know what he's saying to us, but what is the Holy Spirit saying to you? Is he speaking to you about indifference, familiarity with Jesus? Oh, I've heard it all, that's great, wonderful. I've heard all these type of messages before. Don't allow your heart to become hardened and indifferent. Is he talking to you about the hard places of your life where you've not put your roots down deep? You've been satisfied with shallow living and he's calling you to depth. Today is he highlighting the thorns that are choking out the seed's potential in your life today. Cares of this world. Deceitfulness of riches. What's the Holy Spirit saying? Would you just bow your heads, close your eyes with me? Lord Jesus, today, we need you. We cannot do this on our own. Today, we echo the words of Jesus. It says that we can do nothing in our own strength. And even in our weakness, your strength is perfected when we yield. And today, Lord, we yield to you, the sower. You have sown everything for us. You've sown your word into us. Holy Spirit, what would you say to each of us today? What would you say to us? With everybody's eyes closed, no one looking around, this is a moment between you and the Lord, but I do wanna call you to a moment of recognition and reset. Today, number one, if you're here and you believe that the Holy Spirit is highlighting to you that you've been like the wayside, packed down, indifferent, familiar, and you're asking God, plow up, break up the fallow ground because I, I want a brand new reset and awe and wonder and sensitivity to you and I've become indifferent towards it. If the Holy Spirit's highlighting that the soil of your heart is like the wayside, but you're asking him to reset your heart. I just want you to raise your hand if that's you. Thank you for your honesty. You can put your hands down. Today, if the Holy Spirit is highlighting to you that there's a need for you to go deeper, to break up the hard places because you know that there's not the depth, the root system, but the Holy Spirit is calling you to go deeper than you've ever gone before, to really dig into the word, dig into his presence so that you can stand strong under the heat of tribulation and persecution. If that's what he's highlighting to you, I just want you to raise your hand.
thank you, thank you. For your vulnerability, you can put your hands down. The third one is this. Is the Holy Spirit speaking to you about cares of this world that are choking out the word's effect in your life or the deceitfulness, the pursuit of wealth and status? You're surrendering that today, saying, Lord, reset my heart today. I surrender to you today. Have your way in me. If that's you, you raise your hand. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Last one's this. Is the Holy Spirit speaking to you about multiplication, saying, you know what? It's time for you to make other disciples. It's time for you. I want you to raise your expectation levels up. The Holy Spirit's challenging us to think 30, 60, and 100 fold return with our lives. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand. Lord Jesus, you see our hands. I'm praying that you would put the plow into our hearts and break up the fallow ground. Reset us, Holy Spirit. We say yes to your prompting. We say yes to your leading. We say, here we are, God. Lead us, show us, help us. Walk this out. Strengthen us as only you can do. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.